Okay, welcome back to NMRAX. We're uh, now on the Australian uh, the Australian run, so uh, we've been all around, all around the world, I think, today. They've been into Africa, they've been to Mexico, North America. So, uh, yeah, it certainly is an international one. Well, our next presenter is coming all the way from uh, the Australian capital. For all of those in, a, in the US who don't know, it's not Sydney, but it's Canberra. And it's in central New South Wales or mid southern New South Wales. And uh, Pat's here from uh, the town of Queanbeyan, just on the outside. And I believe today you're doing guided rail tours and you've taken some time out to uh, come and have a bit of a chat to us about uh, Canberra Railway. So uh, without any further ado, I think I'll hand it straight over to Pat. Yeah, thanks heaps, Marty. Um, I'll just share the screen and get the first things up. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I thought I was free on Saturday, but, uh, of course, it's Sunday, 1 p.m. here in Canberra, and it's a balmy 38 degrees, which is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit in your language. Uh, so, yeah, a bit hot. So I'm quite glad I'm going to have an hour off of train touring because it's very steamy out there. Um, so yeah, so welcome. So basically I'm going to take you through the history of uh, Canberra Rail. Um, this is just a bit about me. Um, I'm not going to read through it all. Uh, basically I've done two years in Pakistan, two and a half in Canada. Got to go down the uh, east coast of uh, America as you do to go to Disney World. Uh, so I've been through Carolina, Pennsylvania and all those good places. Um, Hadn't been near trains since about 13, just got back into them, 48 years old. I was in HO scale, I'm now an N-Scala. Uh, current president of the Canberra Monero N-Scala uh, group, and you can see my favourite dog in the bottom left corner, affectionately known as Train Dog, who probably enjoys trains more than I do. He demands that they be run every night or he won't come to bed. Um, basically, I've got a 1.7 by 0.7 metre layout at home and recipient of the Brian Dwyer Memorial Award. Uh, for the 1914 Canberra station, which you'll see later in the presentation today. Um, I was so involved in the convention and setting that up in Canberra for the NMRA, and um, I was a bit sceptical about the benefit of NMRA to uh, young members. Um, that totally changed with this NMRAX, which I think is a fantastic resource and I fully support it. That's enough about me. Um, you can ask me any questions from that list of interesting facts there later on. And of course, my last name, Gagel, pronounced Hachel in Holland. And Dad tells me that's like Smith over in old Holland. So basically a bit of context for Canberra in terms of Australia's history. I mean, Australia discovered in 1770, the capital was originally formed uh, following the Eureka Stockade down in Melbourne, which, uh, but Sydney, uh, there was a bit of a discussion about that. And uh, of course, Australia was, uh, uh, five separate states back in its day prior to federation. Interestingly enough, we looked at the Canadian Confederated Provinces back in 1867, which essentially forms the basis of the Australian Constitution, uh, quite ironically. Um, so the first discussions about federation started in 1880, and part of that was actually selecting a capital. Um, they looked at multiple sites. For a long time, it was Dalgetty, which was about 150 kilometres south of here. But finally, they decided that it would be in Canberra. Federation occurred 1st of January 1901. Um, and that basically res resulted in the setting up of the Senate, the House of Representatives, the Office of the Vice Regal or the Governor General and the High Court. Um, So basically the Australian Capital Territory was established because basically a capital city, and even to these days, need to have access to a seaport and strategically be located in land. Uh, due to the squabble between Sydney and Melbourne, it was also stipulated that it had to be beyond 100 miles from Sydney. So that sets all the uh, block work for Canberra to be established. Uh, the other thing is, um, so they launched the national competition. And of course, Walter Burley Griffin won that competition 23rd of May, 1912. I'll just try and move this little window here. Um, so in December 19, and um, basically he took it up and we'll go a bit more into that detail. But Canberra's had a very checkered history in terms of major interruptions of World War I, the Great Depression, World War II. 
Um, even in Canberra building itself, you'll see through the presentation, there was lots of doubt at various times through history whether or not Canberra would actually happen or be built. And indeed, the, the bureaucrats responsible for Canberra never thought Canberra would extend north of the lake. Uh, such was the, the uh, lack of faith in uh, creating this brand new city. And you can see a lot of our landmarks didn't actually occur till the 1960s, 70s and 80s. Um, the most significant of that being the filling of Lake Burley Griffin, which didn't happen until 1964. It should have been filled in 1963. However, it was a drought that year. So when the Queen arrived in 1963, there were no lakes to be opened. So basically the requirements for Canberra was that it must be in New South Wales, 100 miles from Sydney, um, needed access to a seaport, and it was for 2,000 people originally. Now, this is really interesting in terms of Walter Burley Griffin. Walter Burley Griffin being one of the early modernist architects who came across from Chicago after the war, and of course was good friends with a certain architect called Frank Lloyd Wright, who you might have heard of. Um, basically, the competition rules were to design a city for 2,000 people. And it was never published, but uh, Walter Burley Griffin actually uh, in his mind, Reed was going to be a series of five-storey buildings with shops in the bottom level and uh, living above. So theoretically, it is believed that Walter Burley Griffin's design could have actually supported a city of two million people. Now, when you're trying to attract people from Melbourne to Canberra, living in a city like Chicago or Paris was a bit daunting and therefore it never got leads. And you'll see throughout this that there's a lots of ideas that Walter Burley Griffin had which were opposed by the um, bureaucrats. And as a uh, little surprise, they left in frustration in 1920. So just a period of eight years. Uh, there were some other things going on in his personal life, but that won't be covered here in this presentation. Um, so as I said before, they initially looked around Dalgetty. Um, yes, Canberra area was finally selected on the 8th of October, 1908, by a vote in the federal parliament, which at that stage was still down in Melbourne. They also purchased uh, Duntrone Homestead, uh, for the military college. <clears throat> so what was going on around the times when they were designing Canberra? You can see Howard Ebenezer's Garden Cities uh, diagram up in the left-hand side, and there was a few different proponents at the time pushing the whole Garden City uh, ideology. Uh, you can imagine back at that time, they had the industrial cities in the UK, basically where they built cities for factory workers, fairly spog bound based on a grid. So this was a real radical new way of designing cities. Um, the diagram on the right there actually doesn't look like the AC, current ACT map at all, except for the two shapes on the left-hand side. That's the current shape, but originally they also intended to take into the catchment, which includes Queanbeyan. Uh, so they didn't uh, partition that back in, when they created the ACT. However, the ACT still does hold water rights over that whole catchment. Uh, Hence, we've got a dam here called Gugong Dam, which is actually owned and controlled by the ACT government. Down the bottom left is another idea, and remember this name for later, it's Robert Coulter. He was one of a, a local architect, uh, urban designer, uh, quite active in the area at the time, and was also involved in preparation of the competition guidelines. He, um, this diagram on the left is actually his idea. He thought it should be at Lake George because it was a very big water body. Uh, it's probably about 100 kilometres just north of here. The problem with Lake George is it's, um, it fills and empties quite regularly. Uh, at the moment, it's probably about a third full. And the last time I remember it was full when I went to a swimming carnival way back in 1978. So not as glamorous and yeah, you'll have trouble having water there the whole time as pictured in Robert Coulter's diagram. Interesting enough, Coulter also did these watercolour uh, uh, pictures of the Canberra area, which were sent to all the competition entries for the design of Canberra. On the right is also a plaster model, and you can't quite see it on this picture, but I'll point it out on a diagram further, but it's even got a presupposed rail line, and I don't think you can see my mouse, but um, yeah, it'll show up on laid plans. And the bottom right corner is actually the competition uh, rule book that was sent around to various people wanting to uh, enter a design for Canberra. So here's a plan that reflects the plaster model and you can see the dirt line going squiggling up through the centre of the diagram which is where they stipulated the rail line had to be uh, in the competition rule book. Um, 
if anybody's worked as architects and being one in a previous life, I suppose I can comment, uh, they're not the most easy people to uh, follow directions or not the best, not one of their strongest attributes. Uh, so one of the features you'll see when we get to Griffin's design is he didn't adopt that route. So here's the winning entry for Walter Burley Griffin for Canberra. Uh, back in that 19, 1912, 1908 sort of time period. Uh, quite artistic sketch. Uh, if anybody asks, they normally attribute these sketches to Mary Mahoney, but you know, uh, there's no real evidence one way or the other. But anyway, it was the winning sketch. Uh, you can see it pulls out the whole idea of garden cities, different nodes, circular design and linkages between centres. Uh, very geometric and laid out on a, a geometric grid. The main axes actually line up with significant uh, hilltops and, and mountains around Canberra. And this is just a bit of uh, some of the this, this perspectives that were entered as part of the competition entry and just the whole sense of order uh, around Canberra. Uh, quite interesting, you know, Parliament in front of the people in the commercial districts, which stretched across from left to right in front of uh, the Parliament, so they could uh, always see the people they were representing. Of course, uh, and we'll see some of the interventions soon, that never occurred, and Civic ended up on just one of the nodes, which is our, our city centre. So there's two really interesting design rules, and you can see where the intervention and potential sources of frustration start entering the picture here. So the bureaucrats saw the competition as supporting their own work rather than the other way around, rather than the architect or select winning designers actually driving it. Um, the other bit, they saw the competition as a source of ideas to add to their own ideas that they already had. And one of the interesting things about Canberra is a place called Marnica, uh, which on the plant Burley Griffin plans are called the initial city. The bureaucrats thought that was the best place for the city centre because it was in the lee of Mount, and I'm going to forget the name, but basically where Capitol Hill is now, and it was in the lee to the prevailing winter winds, so they thought that was the ideal city centre. Hence, we have a place here called Monica, which is part of a suburb called Griffith, but you won't find it on an actual plan or a map because it was never supposed to exist. And to this day, it still doesn't exist on a map. And if you put it into GPS, it will tell you that Monica does not exist. Um, so anyway, so part of the conditions were that the permeated design shall become the property of the government that restricted use either in whole or in part. And section 23, which said the government by its own officers will give effect to the adopted design. So that was taken quite literally, and shortly after the competition was won and run, they published this, which was their own design. Um, and it is very interesting in that it shows the railway in the original configuration around the lake. Oh, actually, no, it doesn't. It goes, it'll be a later one, but this actually does use Burley Griffins, but they didn't like Burley Griffins alignment. Um, and it was heavily influenced by, and you'll notice this name is for me again of Colter, who are, entrance number 10 and you can see that their uh, plan does include the railway in the original competition uh, entry requirements and why wouldn't it they wrote it um, and also the classic city problem of putting major infrastructure along the side of water bodies which makes it really hard to access for people so anyway so the plan that the department came up with was a combination of competition entry 10 and Burley Griffins into a uh, design uh, conglomeration of the two. And here's the visual. You can see a bit of a Sydney Harbour Bridge thing happening there for the railway, and then a major trap uh, bridge. A lot of the uh, designs did have the parliament at Capitol Hill, and you can see maybe potentially an American style Senate sitting on the hill there. So finally, uh, Walter Burley Griffin was brought back on board after uh, mainly the professional bodies uh, disagreeing with the department on their plan. And this is uh, Griffin's plan of 1916, uh, which was the final published plan. Uh, and he never published another plan before he left Australia. I think the date of this is actually 1918, not 1916. A couple of features to point out here is um, the railway line crosses what is called a causeway. So the lake on the right, which is never built, is called East Lake. It's actually six metres higher than the main lakes. And its main purpose was to bank up any debris coming down the river so it wouldn't pollute the lake. 
Uh, anybody who's been to Canberra lately knows that if we get a lot of rain, the lake gets closed for sailing because you usually have to compete with big logs and trees floating in the lake. Uh, so this would have prevented it. But anyway, I can go through later why it wasn't built. Uh, mainly it was people thought it would be ugly having a 10 metre high causeway across the horizon in Canberra. Uh, but there's lots of those silly little ideas to why things weren't done. So basically now that's the sort of the context of Canberra. I'm going to break now into the railways and how this all started. So basically being part of the N-scale group, I want to model my hometown station at Queanbeyan. However, members told me you can't do that because you know we're doing we're, I'm going to do that model. So you have to pick something else. Why don't you do Canberra? I thought, yeah, but Canberra's really boring. Like, this is all there is. This is our station. It'll be really easy. I don't like the building, even though it is a modern building in terms of architectural terms. And, yeah, but anyway, I relented and said, okay, I'll build Canberra and it'll go with your future Queenbeam, which incidentally hasn't been started yet, but you get that with model railways. So when I first started it, the first thing I came across was this building which has Canberra on it. I thought, this is really odd. Um, so to my surprise, Canberra has a long history of railways and this is the 1914 station. This is one of three photographs I have of the station. And so we commenced building it and another great source was the book up on the left-hand side called Canberra uh, Railways and the Monero Districts. Also, this photo is another famous Canberran, who's uh, Williams James Milden Hall, who born 1891 to 62. He was actually a public servant and he had keen uh, interest in photography. Uh, so he did a whole heap of photographs which were invaluable of Canberra's early development. Unfortunately, he lost his job when people thought it was unfair that a public servant was given the luxury of taking cat pictures and, it, of course, it was outsourced to uh, a commercial provider. But anyway, the first Canberra station was based on what we call the New South Wales Government Railways A4 station, which is the one down at the bottom. Although, because the railways employed tradesmen and builders of all, of all the trades during the days, they quite often modified from the standard design to incorporate uh, other things. So basically from the limited number of photographs and being an architect by profession in a previous life, although I haven't done that now for 15 years, I basically drew up the station from the photographs. The other interesting uh, modification for the A4 station in Canberra is normally the roof over the platform kicks up to give you more head height. But for some reason, maybe it was climatic uh, considerations. Uh, the one in Canberra goes straight down at the same angle and gets quite low. You can see the edge of the roof is at basically a door head height. This will be the second of the photographs which appeared, uh, including the pedestrian gate, and you'll notice the poplars in the background. Also in this picture to the left appeared the 1926 station, which is further beyond the 1914. So here is in styrene, end scale, 1 to 160, basically that end platform view, uh, brass etches for the windows. And this was the design which would go on and win uh, the end scale convention award uh, model of the show. Down the bottom left is uh, in my previous profession, I was a little bit ahead of my time and I did 3D um, buildings and ren uh, renderings of buildings. So that was one of our buildings for the local Radford College. Even though I have that skill, I still find it more therapeutic to building out a styrene and scratch building. Um, so that's the way I've gone with this and I find it quite relaxing. Uh, this is a later shot showing the 1914 station, the 1926 station, and I'm not a big fan of the 1942 extension. So it's just tucked on the end there and I can remove it from the layout when I don't want to look at it. Uh, the 1926 building itself is quite nice and the good shed on the left. I then came across this building, it's a historic photograph, and I always thought the station was on the right, the 1914 station, and the good shed on the left, but it's actually looking from totally the opposite direction. So I thought, that's weird, they changed the window in the station to a, from a double to a single, and they didn't uh, do that at all. And in fact, in the standard goods station, it did have two windows there. So this one's obviously been modified when it was built just to have the one. Uh, 
Uh, you can see a freight wagon on the goods shed and also uh, a pass some passenger cars sitting in front of the 1914 station and some very modern motor vehicles out to the right. So basically this is the recreation of the same photograph, although you can never match the optics exactly. And also I've got the much later, longer extended platform. But we've got passenger cars and we have the, uh, the freight car sitting at the goods station. So this is the 1926 station. Uh, with this one, there's the 1914 on the left. That's the third photograph I have of 1914. 1926 station is to the right. At this stage, it doesn't have the 1942 extension to the right hand side. I was lucky with this one in that I had a bit of a head start and that there's a plan published in the Canberra's Engineering Heritage book. Uh, so I had a head start with this one and didn't have to measure things. Uh, so I could start with that plan once I fixed the scale and the length of the building. So basically I drew up the plan for that, again, to, for the purposes of scratch building the building. I didn't realise at this stage, but there's this architectural style called Federation style or Canberra style. And it's prominent in the high, it doesn't come out from these drawings or the photographs. And there's a photograph from the front of it just prior to the, um, the uh, Duke opening Canberra as new Parliament House in 1927. So this was finished in 1926. But it does pick up and looks very similar to the architecture when you model it as the Hyatt Hotel in Canberra, which is predominant style and also the Hotel Courageong. And that was the name of the mountain I couldn't remember before. It's actually Mount Courageong, uh, where Capitol Hill currently is, it's been renamed. So that's all out of styrene, uh, all scratch built, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, it also has the interior in case I want to go back sometime in the future and finish the interior off, but at the moment it's just all in white styrene. Here's looking up the road. You can see again, 1914 station on the left, 1923 station, 1926 station in the middle, and the 1942 extension is that little roof addition at the end. I had no plans for the 1942 extension other than this uh, newspaper article. And it's really interesting looking back at history. When you look at the newspaper articles, that describes exactly in dimensions, space, and from that one photograph, I could actually recreate like the what the 1942 station would likely be like. It looks similar in architectural style on the front, but quite horrible on the back. And that's the bit I don't like. In this photo, you can also start seeing the emergence of the 1963 station, and that's it during construction. So at one time, the 1963, 1942, 1926 and 1914 stations existed all in a row. But at this stage, the 1914 was used as a staff office for uh, uh, railway staff working at the station. And here's just another view of all three in a row from the roadside. So you've got 1914, 1926. I have to improve my join a bit with the 1942 bit, but that's okay because most of the time it probably won't be there because I don't like it. And you can just see the emergence of the 1963 station on the right there. So it was really interesting, even researching the current station, that it was only ever planned to be a temporary station. And uh, we'll get through this as we go through more of the planning of Canberra. So it was supposed to connect to a, um, by this time, there was originally planned a railway through to Yass to link us to the Sydney Melbourne route. Uh, but in the meantime, they chartered in 1963 a new route through the Majura Valley. So hence this railway station was viewed as being temporary because they'd build a future one. And you can see on the diagram there, possible site for new rail passenger terminal. And that basically aligns with the airport and through to the Majura Valley. Uh, Canberra's always been interesting in terms of railway stations and the railway station is not at the city centre. And as we get into the planning a bit more when it returns later, you'll also see that um, there was also controversy about where the city centre was gonna be. So yeah. So that would make it hard to locate a railway station in the city centre when it hadn't been decided. And this is basically a photo from probably a week or two ago of uh, where that model's currently at. The flags on the flagpole are basically a photograph. I basically stuck it in Word, uh, did one 
did it uh, back to front, reversed, mirror imaged it, then just folded the paper in half and glued it to the flagpole. And there you have flags. So it's not a high resolution shot. Uh, there's the flags as well. Um, and this is a couple of weeks early before I've done more painting on the station. You can see here the emergence of the railway in the uh, in the cutting. And basically that's Griffin's route uh, that would have gone through to a station called Southbourne. And basically I'm going to call this Griffin station. Never existed, but I'm going to model that up anyway as to what potential could have been. And you can see the poplar trees in the background. Only one has totally been finished. And this is my design, which I borrowed for a local 1950s Canberra building, uh, just to be the Griffin station down in the cutting. And of course, I'm going to make it contemporary, so it needs a lift for disabled access. And interestingly enough, one of the stations at Russell, one of the reasons that that Canberra railway was not never built into the city is they complained that passengers would have to traverse 35 feet of stairs down into the station because of course back in that time they didn't have escalators uh, they did have lifts but they couldn't move high volumes of people like an escalator can so that was one of the reasons why Griffin's railway was knocked on the head and delayed uh, a bit longer and that is from Friday night actually I just uh, did the first facade and the stairs have been in existence for some year some time Just a bit of vision. This is a New South Wales 44 class. You can hear train dog jumping up and down on the floor in the background, which is the tapping noise. So that's a New South Wales government railways train from the 70s. Here's a separate one, which I decided to put on uh, a famous train in Australia called the Indian Pacific on and imagine what it would be like if it um, pulled into Canberra at some time. And, you know, I'd certainly ride it. Um, so that was really interesting. That's a model that's built from a kit, uh, painted, decalled it, and similarly with the carriages, they're all kits, uh, decalled and painted, and they don't like the uh, the frog on that uh, Eco 55 uh, long point. Anyway, we'll have a look at that. I think there's some fixes for that. So when I published that on the web, my friend came back to me and said, Pat, that's not a silly idea. The India Pacific did actually come to Canberra for promotional tours in 1973 and one for later on. So the left photo is actually a picture that he took at uh, Canberra Station, Indian Pacific, New South Wales Government Railways 44 class in reverse livery. And on the right is a later photo, um, again, to promote the Indian Pacific. Uh, this is actually taken at Queanbeyan Station, my local town, but it's en route to Canberra for promotions again. I'll just check how we got for time. Oh, heaps of time. Good. Um, so basically beyond the Canberra Station, there was also a rail spur, which basically went down into a suburb of Canberra called Kingston. Kingston also had the first power station in Canberra as well and had a spur line to deliver coal. So along that spur and branch delivered a, developed a whole lot of industries. So the building in the centre there near the white rack is the engineer's office. Uh, further back is a uh, uh, cargo office. The white building is the carpenters and metal engineer's office. Uh, in the foreground in front of that building, I believe, is the concrete uh, pipe works. So basically everything in Canberra was constructed Canberra was built at a very interesting time, as you can see a truck there in the foreground, uh, which was the trucking technology at the time, and there's another truck I just noticed over to the right there near the steel rack as well. So Kingston now has sort of been got medium density housing through it, but it was an industrial centre of the town, and uh, one stage regarded as a slum, uh, hence they wanted to get gone. But uh, basically everything in Canberra was fabricated or constructed in that in that uh, suburb. So in terms of Griffins and railways, he saw railways as central to cities and, and he called them a form of communications. So part of his original design following the competition was actually to design linkages through the main Sydney uh, Melbourne line. So on the left hand side, you can see the dark unbroken line has been the 1916 trial survey through to Yes, connecting Yes. And on the right is the later 1965 survey, which um, 
it goes through the Majura Valley, north of Canberra, and obviously uh, supports that other picture of a future railway design. The image on the right, you remember the competition guidelines said we had to have a link to a seaport. So Jervis Bay and Huskisson were supposed to be Canberra seaport, and this is the railway uh, line surveyed through to there. Again, 1916, never built. Uh, in all seriousness, we'd never have Jervis Bay as our seaport because it's an environmentally significant area, and I don't think you'd ever get uh, permission from the Greenies to develop it as a uh, uh, going seaport. So this is the latest uh, scenario, and back when I put it, this in the presentation, it was still being considered by the New South Wales government. It's since been judged as unviable. Uh, before Canberra, there was a railway line all the way down to Bombala in the bottom of the diagram. Uh, it's been closed for a number of years, but this looked at opening that line again and extending it from Bombala to the Port of Eden, which in my mind is a great solution. And then when I actually uh, did some work down in Eden, the bottom yellow line is actually the line we took, which is an old forestry road, which uh, avoids very steep, narrow mountain uh, roadways. It's quite a good drive. And this is just another later diagram. So this is, uh, there are various plans for what they call the arsenal, which is basically a munitions dump to support the, and defend the city. Um, this one shows it north in a suburb called Dixon, uh, but there were plans to put it south as well in Tuggeranong. So basically there was a lot of objections. So the railways were handed over to what was called the Commissioner of Commonwealth Railways to make adjudication on. So Route A, and you may not be able to see it on this map, but it's the northernmost one to the market centre, which was actually handed over to Defence, and the market centre and civic centre all become the town centre. So it was never realised. The market centre station was also the station that was rejected in the basis that it had 35 foot of stairs down to the station platform, which was not thought of at the time as being uh, desirable, and hence that scheme, one of the major detractors to that scheme. The other thing was that it had to be tunnelled through Russell uh, to get to, uh, uh, it's called the Parkway on Griffin's Plan, but it's now called Anzac Parade. Um, so the Rail Commission had come up with alternatives that were cheaper to build to get a railway into Civic. And basically they recognised Griffin's long-term ambitions for a railway. So uh, their scheme is also offset from Griffin, so it could be built as a temporary railway, allowing the future one to be built. So this is the plan for the 1916 uh, Parliamentary Works Committee, which is basically our committee which approves major expenditure on infrastructure. You can also see that the politicians and the bureaucrats were driving a railway line crossing Kings Avenue Bridge, which uh, curls around there just below the uh, to the right of the Capitol. You also notice still at this early day the perseverance of the very geometrically shaped lake basins, which was later abandoned in 1963 or when they moved on with the lakes. And you can see here that uh, the later plan of the lake system. Uh, and you can also see here the initial studies on the bottom left of the diagram of the causeway. So East Lake on the right, which was never constructed, was actually supposed to be six metres higher than the main lakes. And again, to control sediment and uh, rubbish coming into the main lakes. Again, some more design studies, uh, presumably by the engineers to reduce the visual effect of the uh, causeway on the, on the campus skyline and still using similar technology. So the diagram on the top left uh, shows what we call as a clay liner, which is essential with any modern dam construction just to uh, make sure it's watertight. Uh, the diagrams on the bottom, um, just basically show Griffin's idea. Griffin's idea of the railway through the city was that it wasn't to interrupt and there was to be no level crossings. So you got to remember there was no electric trains at this time. It was all still steam. So his idea was to dig the railways down six feet and use the um, the excavation excavated material to build a further three foot berm along all the railways, and that basically would allow uh, bridges across the railway line, so there would be no level crossings. So again, revolutionary, ahead of his time. The view wouldn't be good, but then again, he designed it as a 
commuter rather than a, a scenic railway. So the railway was extended into Canberra and this is the bridge completed in March of 1922. Uh, and presumably the engineer, whoever designed it standing on it, again, a temporary bridge because uh, it was built off the alignment of Griffin's Railway. Um, and it was allowed to get construction materials into Canberra. Here's a picture from uh, Mount Pleasant and you can actually see the, the bridge still standing and the line going into Canberra. The building in the background is the Kingston Powerhouse and the industrial area of Kingston to the left of the Powerhouse. This was the Civic Railway Station uh, built and actually not removed the platform. The track was removed 1935-36. The platform didn't actually get removed until the 60s. So it was there for a long time. And this is what happened to the bridge in September of 1923. Basically, a flood came down. You'll notice in the earlier photos, the bents were built at an angle or the frames that support the bridge at an angle to the water flow. Basically, a whole lot of debris built up and took the bridge out. Uh, at that time, the Parliamentary Works Committee decided not to rebuild the bridge until Canberra grew bigger. Just a view from another shot. This is a Mildon Hall shot. Lovely photos. So basically here we have the temporary con uh, Canberra's railway lines in total, uh, which I found in another book. Uh, basically you have the line, uh, Griffin's line going to Central Station, which is now where Russell is, uh, the defence facilities, and then City Station uh, Re and Reed. Um, you can see that it's offset from Griffin's, the temporary construction railway, and uh, that's really good because that means I can model both. Um, also, we had what was called a narrow gauge railway, which I never knew about, but basically it transported bricks from the brickworks through to Parliament, Old Parliament House and to the City Hotel. Uh, and it was also extended through to the Kingston Power House to exchange with the main uh, standard gauge railway. After the bridge got washed out, they also extended it northwards um, across the middle of what is the current lake, but was then a river through Scott's Crossing. And the reason why railways are really important, particularly in a place like Canberra, we have very clay soils. So as soon as you get any rain, the the, uh, the roads just turn into big bog holes. So rail was the most efficient uh, and effective method of getting construction materials, both from around the state, but also once here around the city to the various uh, areas of uh, main efforts of construction. So there is one of our narrow gauge engines and the bottom photo, I believe, is Scott's Crossing uh, through the middle of what's now the lake, but at the back of that stage, the river. Uh, Kingston Powerhouse, uh, there's currently a road there and uh, this shows the narrow gauge line and the cars pulled by the little, and even the narrow gauge steam train there. Uh, at Kingston Powerhouse and this was the uh, state-of-the-art excavator back in the time, Steve's steam-powered excavator with a water cart behind it. So you can imagine the cost of Griffin's Railways using this sort of technology at that time would have been quite uh, cost prohibitive and hence why he may not have got uh, traction when there wasn't a lot of faith or belief that Canberra would ever be a success. And here's a picture of showing the narrow gauge railway in front of our provisional parliament house. This is the Yarralumla Brickworks, where the narrow gauge railway ran from. And this is a separate uh, narrow gauge railway. Uh, this is actually horse drawn, and it's actually just down from Kingston Powerhouse, which is the sand processing centre where they process sand for uh, building. Another narrow gauge railway, again, it, it was just a construction railway used for building uh, Cotter Dam. And this is a hand pushed trolley system or narrow gauge railway system used for building the sewerage works out at Western. Again, it wasn't connected to anything else. It was just used to move construction materials around efficiently. And this is uh, Griffin's final, final plan. Now you've seen it before, but you'll notice that the market center is across there to the right, uh, which ended up uh, and is currently to this day, uh, the military officers or defense officers in Canberra. But other than that, largely the configuration is the same. Uh, the lakes never took up those pure geometric forms of the uh, centre basin, uh, east and west basin. In terms of the model, uh, this is my proposal to build it all the way to Russell. Um, so we have Canberra Station down at the left. 
uh, I plan to build the causeway uh, east lake, but also the temporary construction line in front of it, which should be pretty dramatic. And then also the industrial spurs through to Kingston. And then it'll loop back and yeah, just come back. So that's uh, sort of it in a nutshell. I'm just open to any questions now. And I'll stop sharing so you don't get irritated by that questions. Okay, that was absolutely brilliant, Pat. I mean, uh, I've never, uh, uh, I've uh, been to Canberra quite a few times, but uh, it's uh, it was quite interesting to see how uh, how those things developed. I mean, uh, as uh, our friends from overseas can see, you know, Canberra's got a lot of roundabouts in it, so you you, you tend does. to get lost. Well, I do whenever I go to Canberra. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, GPS solved anyway. that problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, the GPS would help. I mean, the last time I was in Canberra, we were using a street directory, so they weren't yeah, very yeah. Uh, they weren't very handy. Uh, you you no. missed the turn off. Yeah. Okay. Oh, um, we've we've got a few questions uh, coming up here in uh, in the chat. We got a f first one over on Facebook. Does the, the name Canberra have a meaning? Oh. Um, yeah, like everything, it seems to mean clear water. Um, I'd have to look that one up. It does have a meaning, but um, Queen Bin is clear water. I can't recall what Canberra means. If you ask most people, they, it means ruined sheep paddocks, but anyway, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's probably an Aboriginal name for something like that, but anyway. Uh, Thomas yeah. up in Canada, he, uh, he, up the northern of America, he's asking what passenger trains stopped there and how come the Indian Pacific didn't stop in Canberra? Um, so basically I call Canberra Australia's bit of biggest cul-de-sac. Those three routes were never built, so basically everything comes here and stops. So there's no commercial advantage for the larger trains to come through here. And the trains we do have are operated by New South Wales Government Railways, and basically they were mandated in the Constitution, but also further um, made responsible and, and assigned to New South Wales Railways in the Federal Capital Act, which was the act that formed Canberra. Okay. So our lines don't go to anywhere, so there's not much incentive for through traffic or freight. We get three trains a day at the moment to Sydney, and that's it. No, basically, Canberra is, uh, is basically the capital, and like you said, uh, basically, you go into Canberra and uh, not much goes through Canberra. But no. uh, Yeah, we've got the Great Dividing Range to our uh, west. That's so a bit of a barrier. And Thomas was asking as well, uh, is N-scale more of a challenge? Hmm, well, it's ironic that I got into N-scale as I'm getting older and my eyesight's getting worse. Um, but I just like the sort of more expansive layouts you can build with it. But yeah, I always have goggles on when I'm modelling N-scale because I can hardly yeah. see it. <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine calls it eye strain scale, but uh, yeah, but, uh, but it's challenging. Well, anyway. I, model, I model with some guys on a Friday night, and um, they don't let that get in the way of doing the details. So I find that quite inspiring. No, no, that's that's good. Uh, well, over in uh, YouTube, we've got uh, uh, we've got some more questions. We've got a bit of a hum happening there. Yeah, Jerry's on. <laughs> Just go on mute, Jerry. Uh, here we go. Um, Crafty Method is saying he's uh, great. He's researching a, a southwestern Australian port, oldest town western side of Australia. So uh, it looks like he's from Albany in Western Australia. Because he's also asking, is there more roundabouts in Canberra or Albany in Western Australia? So. Being someone who's never been to Albany, I wouldn't know how many roundabouts are there. But uh, yeah, I think I've only been to that side of the country twice in my lifetime. So yeah, I don't know, and never to Albany. So. Mm. But uh, we've uh, yeah, we've got uh, you got a lot of good, great comments on the on the presentation on the uh, okay. on the YouTube there. Uh, I don't know if I've missed any out. I'll scroll back here. Uh, yeah, so those, um, Griffin also designed Griffith and Leeton in Australia as well, which a lot of people may not know. Um, so, yeah, it has similar roundabouts and Garden City theme. 
Okay, yeah, crafty method saying it's a big joke over here, no red lights in our city. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, our engineers tried not to use traffic lights in the early days, but uh they've succumbed to technology lately. We seem to have traffic lights everywhere now. <laughs> okay, yes, uh it, it seems to, to, to work that way. But uh so um you're off uh, doing railroad tours this afternoon or uh, around the museum. So can you give us a bit of a, uh, a breakdown about what you, what, uh, what's involved in that uh, so and, and what, what you've got operating there? Yeah, so we don't have anything operating at the moment. Unfortunately, the previous organisation went bankrupt uh, probably two years ago now. Um, so a lot of the rolling stock got sold off. We did have the Garrett down here, which was restored here, but it got sold as part of the... Uh, by the receivership uh, people, um, but we do have New South Wales uh, F uh, BFS cars. Uh, we have a southern, two Southern Aurora cars. One's out at the moment doing historic rail tours, which is the dining car. We still have the sleeper here. We have 1210, which is steam train, which was pulled the first train into Canberra. Uh, we have an old Pullman carriage, uh, which has been restored by a fellow. He's been working on it single-handedly for 30 years. And hopefully he's got lots more birthdays to finish it off. Um, and, yeah, it's just some other old timber, uh, a few man carriages, which was the competitor to Pullman, and Pullman ended up buying man out. Uh, Pullman carriages the passengers love, but if the man fitted more passengers, the railway companies preferred the man cars. Um, <laughs> We have a CPH here, which the kids can blow the horn on, which I'm amazed we haven't heard so, during this presentation. So and to uh, to to let yeah, our uh, friends overseas know what what what's a CPH? Uh, so a CPH is a really small regional uh, uh, passenger car. So it's a composite. It has first and second class, a guards van, and it's a little six cylinder diesel motor. They originally had petrol, but after the war they changed them all to diesel. Uh, has a gearbox and is driven by a single drive shaft through a differential to a single axle. So, but very cheap to run on regional lines because it only needed two staff, a guard and a driver. Ah, right, yes. The no, old tin no. hairs, they were called. Hmm. Yes, yeah. Being a, I uh, model Victorian railways and we had uh, the same, they were called derms or diesel electric rail motors uh, yeah, at the, these at the time. Smaller. And, yeah, they uh, carry yeah. about 36 passengers, so, yeah. Okay, well, uh, we got any more questions come up in the chat there? Uh, Thomas is asking, are you a train driver? No, I'd like to be, but no. <laughs> I just really like them, and I got into them when I was in Canada because they really know how to put trains together there in Canada with their two- and three-kilometre-long trains. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm. And uh, Jonathan Hill had... Uh, Dropped in there, he said, Martin, the name probably derived from the local Aboriginal word for meeting place. So, yeah, so that's right. Yeah, there you go. Right. That's what that's what Canberra stands for. But yeah. anyway, Pat, that was uh, a brilliant uh, presentation. And uh, we might have to get you back to maybe have a little look around the rail, uh, the rail museum at one stage and, uh, yeah, and see, see what we can what we can put together. Mm -hmm.